uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, thanks for uh, the guys from outside South Africa tuning in. Uh, today, as we mentioned, we have a special guest. Is the SAFA president. Is the CAF vice president. He was the CEO of the World Cup 2010 organizing committee. And uh, we thought we, have, we could have a bit of a change from uh, what we normally do. We normally talk uh, coaching matters. But since it's the 10 year anniversary of the World Cup 2010 hosted by South Africa, we felt that it would be uh, only fair to pay tribute to, to someone who played a, a crucial role in bringing the World Cup to, to uh, South Africa and the African continent for the very first time. Uh, I think it was a historic event. It was one of the best ever World Cups when you look at the quality of play as coaches we would know. Uh, and it was also a first for Spain in winning the World Cup. We had seen, uh, from the coaching perspective, we had seen uh, new trends in, in world football where the, the move was to more possession-based football uh, with a lot of uh, technical application, a lot of uh, playing intelligence, the football brain. So I think it, it fitted in well with what we've been trying to talk about on, on these Zoom sessions for the past few weeks. Uh, President, uh, once again, welcome. Uh, firstly, I would like to start, maybe a lot of people don't know the man behind the man. Uh, uh, some people don't know you from the Eastern Cape. Uh, you played football uh, at, at, a, at a quite a high level in those days in the segregated leagues. Uh, you were also a coach. And uh, importantly, you, you played a very big role in the, in, the, in the political struggle to liberate this country. Uh, welcome, President. Can you please uh, give us a few warm words from your side? Thanks. Uh, I'm known as Danny Jadam. I was born in the Eastern Cape. Of course, the Eastern Cape, I think, has produced many leaders in this country from Nelson Mandela, Walter Sisulu, Tabo Mbeki, Governor Mbeki, and so on and so on. Uh, from a sports perspective, uh, it is a region that has produced the current captain of the Springboks. In fact, uh, Siakolisi comes from my town, Port Elizabeth, which also has produced many uh, football and, and cricket and rugby uh, leaders in our country. But um, by the time I went to university in the Western Cape, in Cape Town, uh, it was in the period of the 70s. Now, of course, when we uh, got to the university, in the period of the 60s, 1960s specifically, there was what is called in our country, uh, the Sharpeville Massacre, where South African men and women took to the street and marched against what was called a Dompas. You had to carry this card with you uh, to prove that you belong in the cities because the cities essentially was for white people. So if anyone else needs to be in the city, you must have this uh, pass. And so they, the march was intended to bring an end to the, uh, the past laws. Many of people were mowed down, killed, uh, in the streets of, of Sharpeville. And after that, of course, in the 60s was what is called the Ravonia uh, arrests of Nelson Mandela and many other of the leaders. And so after the banning of all liberation movements, political parties, uh, all the leaders at the time, um, it is what the historians would call the silent 60s. The apartheid government then believed that they had crushed uh, the liberation movement in, in South Africa. <clears throat> and you see the impact on, on sport because in 1961 in London at the FIFA Congress, the FIFA Congress pushed by the few African countries who were then members of, of uh, FIFA, decided to suspend South Africa. 
So South Africa was suspended in September 1961, uh, immediately after the Sharpe massacre and the arrest of Mandela. So by the time we came into the 70s, 1970s at the universities, all political parties were banned. It is then when Steve Biko uh, and other leaders formed uh, the student movement, South African student organization, SASO, of which Steve Biko was, was the leader. And many of us uh, on, the, on the campuses then joined and became members of SASO. So, uh, in the 70s, the apartheid government then tried various means to get back into uh, international football. And they had a big sympathizer in Sir Stanley Arouz, who was then the president of uh, FIFA. And he came with a proposal that said that South Africa can host a white team in the 1966 World Cup in England and a black team in the 1970 World Cup in Mexico. Of course, that generated a lot of opposition uh, to such clear racist uh, proposal because every country must have one national team and never a national team based on race. Uh, they wanted to entrench Absolutely. apartheid. And of course, uh, you know that apartheid, uh, person like me, I were, voted for the first time in my life in 1994. I was not allowed to vote. I was not allowed to live in a white area. I was not allowed to go to school in a white area. I was not allowed to play with white uh, players. So it was a separation of race from birth to death. We even went to separate graveyards. You cannot go to the graveyard uh, of white people. Maybe the destined to heaven a shorter from there. But in any case, that was the life we lived. So from a sport perspective, we were then part of the sports movement. Um, people like Sam Ram Sammy who operated from London. We worked with them. And so we had two objectives. One, that uh, South Africa must be suspended from all international federations and finally expelled until the day that everyone in our country has a democratic right uh, to vote for a government of his or her choice. So we continued um, the agitation. Uh, first, we were members of SACOS, the South African Council of Sport, that is slogan of no normal sport in an abnormal society. Of course, uh, a racist apartheid society uh, was abnormal. And therefore we said there should first be a normal society, a non-racial society. Uh, <clears throat> and then later we formed the National Sports and Olympic Congress that continued uh, the struggle against apartheid sport. Now, the, from the early 70s, more and more African teams uh, African countries gained independence and more African countries had a stronger voice both in CAF, in the IOC, as well as in FIFA. And in 1976 then, after what was called in our country the 1976 uh, uprising, the Soweto uprising, we then agitated that South Africa must be expelled from FIFA. And finally that was achieved uh, in 1976. And that was, again, because uh, Joe Havelange, who obviously came from Brazil, made an undertaking to the African delegates that should you vote for me and should I become president of, of FIFA, we will expel South Africa. Uh, and so uh, people like Issa Hayato had worked hard uh, and finally, Havelange became the president and South Africa was expelled uh, from FIFA in 1976. So you see the history of South Africa is one of being a member of FIFA in 1910, being suspended in 1961, expelled in 1976. South Africa was a founder member of CAF 
1957, was immediately <coughs> suspended by TAF because in the first AFCON in 1957, they, won, they refused to select uh, a South African team on a non-racial basis. And so CAF immediately suspended uh, their founder member, South Africa. Uh, so we were out of um, CAF and FIFA from the 1970s until 1992, when we returned to be a member of CAF and a member of FIFA again. So we had gone a full circle, a member of CAF and FIFA, suspended by CAF and FIFA, expelled by CAF and FIFA, returned uh, as a member in 1992. Of course, in 1990, Nelson Mandela was released uh, and we felt the time had arrived where we achieved three things in our country. One, that all of the national federations must be unitary bodies and must be non-racial, must be focusing on development, and later then return to international competition. So we had campaigned for South Africa's expulsion and then campaigned for South Africa's inclusion uh, into CAF and FIFA. And finally, of course, uh, after the 1994 World Cup in the United States, uh, and I think that World Cup was the first one that we could attend officially, we attended uh, the FIFA meeting uh, in Chicago, and it was in that Chicago meeting where a decision was taken to increase the number of uh, countries in the World Cup to 32. And uh, of course, there was a lot of lobbying for Africa to get more slots in the World Cup. But Six Marewa, who was then president of South Africa should make bid for the World Cup. And that's where uh, the decision was then taken in for the 2006 World Cup. Of course, we were not successful. We lost by one vote uh, when Dempsey abstained 12 to 11 and then continued. And I think one of the, the difference between 2006 and 2010 is that FIFA had taken a decision that uh, the 2010 World Cup was for African countries only. And uh, I think that gave us a strong chance. I think also the fact that we had uh, Nelson Mandela supporting us, Archbishop Tutu, that we had the emotional support as a result of the fallout of the 2006 decision. Uh, but we still had to do a lot to convince uh, FIFA and the international community that uh, an African country can host this event because, as you may know, it was a difficult, difficult path. I think I must stop there, otherwise Absolutely. I will talk forever. Yeah, uh, President, thanks, I think, for, for, for the background because we have a lot of international guests here. We have a lot of young coaches and younger South Africans who might not know the tragic past of this country, the segregated leagues that we have. Some of us played in those leagues, played across those leagues. I want to fast forward to 2010. On this day, on the 2nd of July, there were two games, uh, Holland versus Brazil and Ghana versus Uruguay. Uh, what does that bring back to you? Because you have been part of this journey from obviously the 60s. You have seen our reintroduction into international football. You've been part of the bidding process from uh, the late 90s for the 2006. Your proudest moment. Uh, I don't want to talk about when we were announced as, a, as the host, but when the actual World Cup happened. As I mentioned on this day, there were two great games on that day. But for you as a person who have come through this journey, as you briefly mentioned, what was three of your proudest moments over to you. Well, I, uh, as you s rightly say, that uh, it was a long journey and a hell of a journey. Uh, the international community just did not believe that there's an African country that could deliver this World Cup. 
Now, uh, you know, a country like Morocco tried five times and we must give them credit because in a, in a sense, uh, they opened the path that the world must actually look closely and more seriously about birds from the African continent. Uh, there were three challenges, I think. One, there was an argument that uh, Africa does not have the capacity. They will, will not honor the undertakings given to FIFA. They will not meet the strict timelines in, in terms of building infrastructure. And lastly, that you know that uh, in the 2002 World Cup, uh, there was a period of great financial stress for FIFA. And so FIFA needed to recover from that serious financial challenges that they, that they had faced. And so there was a question of whether or not African, any African country can deliver the kind of revenue that FIFA had as a target because you must know the World Cup comes once every four years. And so what you have to do, the 2006 World Cup, for example, must deliver the full budget, if not the surplus, on all the operating costs from 2006 to 2010. And similarly, 2010 must deliver uh, the revenue for the budget of 2010 to 2014. And there was a great doubt that whether an African World Cup can deliver. Uh, of course, what was key is the commercial partners, whether or not the commercial partners will see an African World Cup as an opportunity of investment. And we had done a lot of work in that regard. Well, safe to say that the 2010 World Cup, South Africa, generated 4 billion US dollars. The 2006 World Cup in Germany generated 2.8 billion. So we exceeded any expectation uh, that FIFA may have had in terms of revenue. So that debunked uh, the myth that the myth, yeah. ironically lasted for 100 years from 1904 <coughs> to 2004 when we awarded the World Cup. And even after we were awarded the World Cup, that was the first idea that the world has seen, the idea of a plan B. It was a racist concept. Let's be clear about that. But it was deflating that you work for 10 years, you awarded the event, and immediately the next thing is doubt is cast. Can we trust them? Can they deliver? There must be a plan B, uh, and so on. So. The, the notion of Afro-pessimism, and in today's word, they had their knee on our necks as Africa. And what the World Cup has done is to remove that knee from the neck of Africa. We delivered every bit of infrastructure on time and ahead of time. So when we came to the actual event, by the time we came to the opening ceremony and the concert, in fact, it was uh, when did FIFA have an opening concert and an opening ceremony to opening match? Uh, this was unique and a first for the African continent. By the time we came to the quarterfinals that you were talking about, I can still remember uh, the match in Port Elizabeth, my hometown, uh, and Netherlands uh, wiped Brazil off uh, the field on that day. And of course, the last match at 8.30 on that evening at FNB Stadium. And by then, of course, South Africa had been out of the World Cup and everybody had moved to support yes, Ghana. To Ghana. And this, yeah. this was a unique feature of, of the African World Cup. In Europe, you cannot think that the supporters of Germany, if their team drop out, that they will support England. It cannot happen. Or the Brazilian supporters, if Brazil drops out, that they will now support Argentina. It can't happen. So you can see the deep passion of the African football fan, that all the South African fans 
went to support Ghana and called them Bagana Bagana because South Africa is called yeah. Bafana Bafana. And of course, we wanted an African World Cup to do two things. One, to see an African team in the final stages of the competition, the semi-final and final stages, and to make sure that it is a step change, a launch pad for African football to move on a different trajectory when it comes to, to World Cup, both in terms of hosting and participation. So that Ghana game really carried the hope of what we wanted for Africa's first World Cup. And the support was tremendous. Of course, uh, we will remember so uh, there was a second hand of God in that match that eliminated uh, Ghana. <laughs> yeah, the famous, the famous Suarez incident. Yes. Uh, so the second hand of God in a FIFA World Cup that eliminated uh, uh, Ghana. Uh, and of course, it was a devastating moment for Ghana, for the uh, African fans in the World Cup, and for the people in general in South Africa. But, and that shows you the, the commitment to football first as an African fan, because they immediately moved to support Spain, because Spain plays the kind of football that African fans celebrate and enjoy, and then the Netherlands. So the stadium was still full. Uh, in other World Cups, and I've been to every World Cup since 94, you find that the stadium is empty if one of the big teams drop out. And here, Ghana uh, dropped out, South Africa dropped out earlier. The people were still coming uh, to support the event. So it was not just about the teams. It was a special, unique experience for football fans on the continent and a moment of intense pride and celebration for every African. And as I said during the presentation, this World Cup will put a smile on every African face. And I think indeed uh, we did that. So uh, that game on the 2nd of July, 10 years ago, uh, was a cold night, but uh, both a memorable celebration of the best that Africa could produce, but also a painful night that we have to say goodbye to the last African team uh, in the 2010 World Cup. I don't know why you picked 2nd uh, <laughs> of July. <laughs> yes, President, I think uh, it was a painful memory for a lot of us. For me personally, uh, 2010 World Cup, I cried uh, twice when Bafana were knocked out and then when Ghana was knocked out. Uh, so for me also, it was very painful. But I would like to highlight something, and I think the colleagues who are here, uh, when you mentioned the Afro-pessimism, you know, we look at the racism in, 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 in sport, in football, in Europe, and in other countries. And I think we don't give ourselves as Africans enough acclaim because this was, to me, an example of African excellence, black excellence, to show the world that Africans are just as good, if not better than any, anybody else. Yes, everyone knows that Africans can play the game well, but the 2010 World Cup actually highlighted how all Africans can get together and put on the best showpiece, sporting showpiece in, in, in the world, and that's the World Cup. And I think we don't give ourselves due credit. Uh, President, just to pick your mind further, you, you, you mentioned something very important about the performance of African teams, and then you, you, you mentioned something about Spain's performance. In your opinion, what would you think should be the way forward to develop African football so that we can at least compete to, 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 to not just reach the group stages, but to win the World Cup, to go into the semifinals, to go into the final, to actually try to win the World Cup? I think it's been years, we all know the, 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 the abundance potential and the talent we have on the continent. Uh, France won. The, the last World Cup with majority of the players being of African heritage. What would you think, based on your experience, you've been in the game a long time, you've been to numerous World Cups, uh, where would you say we are going wrong? And how do you think we could eventually an African, see an African country winning the World Cup? Yeah, I, I, I think 
first of all, there are two points that I want to make. Uh, FIFA had hosted 22 World Cups so far. And of the 22, 11 World Cups were hosted in Europe. Five by Comnibol or South America, three by yeah. CONCACAF, two by Asia, and one by Africa. Now, when you go to, when you ask the question, when will we win the World Cup uh, as Africa? Or, we must look at the history of World Cup champions. First, there are 211 member countries of FIFA. Only eight countries out of 211 won the World Cup. Brazil won it five times, Germany four times, Italy four times, France twice, Uruguay twice, England once, Spain once. Those are your champions. And so, uh, in Europe, out of 55 countries, only five won the World Cup. In Africa, of course, 54 countries, no one won the World Cup. So we, we must ask the question, why is there such a high concentration of both hosting of the World Cup and the winning of the World Cup? And okay, they, you raise the technical areas, which needs a lot of uh, attention and a lot of detailed application of the mind on the African continent. But there is a second thing, and that is the football economy. The football economy, in fact, in, the, in terms of football, we have a unipolar football economy. All the best players are in Europe. All the revenue are generated in Europe. All the broadcast <coughs> revenue in Europe. And so the rest of the world is merely supplying uh, the fundamental uh, material for revenue generation in Europe. So you have one strong center in terms of the revenue. And when you look at, but where are the money actually coming from? The investment comes from the Middle East. The sponsors come from Asia. Uh, the sponsors come from America. And, and the question then is, how is it that uh, one center attracts revenue from throughout the world and investment from throughout the world? Why is it that the investors in the Middle East are not seeing African football as an opportunity or even Asian investors see Asia as a new growth point? Uh, for for strengthening football on the Asian continent, I think it's a conversation that we must have, uh, and and certainly uh, we have to ask ourselves questions on the African continent. You see, when you go to the the global clubs like Real Madrid, Barcelona, Man United, Tottenham Hotspur, Bayern Munich, you will find them having a presence on every continent. Why? Because they take into account <coughs> that they want to see fans outside the borders of their own country. Clubs on the African continent Absolutely. see the beginning and the end of their support base within the geographical boundaries of their own country. al Ahly, for example, is a big club. When are they going to have a website in Spanish, in Japanese? Uh, and, and so Mamalodi Sundowns uh, and, and other clubs, there are major clubs here. So if, we, uh, if you look on the African continent, you see Real Madrid jerseys, Man United in virtually every African country. Uh, so we have to think beyond our own borders of our own countries and think beyond the borders of our own continent. But then we also have to look at uh, the structure and organization of our competition and behind our competition uh, to see what are the things that we have to do 
to compete uh, on that global stage. The other important factor for me is you see where the revenue comes from. It comes from uh, Facebook, uh, from Apple, from Microsoft, from Netflix. Uh, and so when you ask the federations on the African continent, what percentage of revenue comes from those areas other than broadcast because essentially on the African continent the revenue was generated from uh, sponsorship or commercial packages and broadcasting. In Europe they have those two uh, revenue streams also but they have match day revenue, they have huge prize money, uh, they have merchandising and licensing uh, and then uh, the new media platforms that generates a lot of revenue for, for uh, the European competitions. And then the building of, of icons uh, on the continent. Uh, Africa still depends that the only icons we have in football is in Europe. And when they are not in our national teams, uh, our own fans uh, are reluctant to come to the match. So there needs to be a strong marketing drive uh, behind players playing on the continent. They must be known because some of them are equal, if not better than some of the players who play in, 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 in Europe. Because it cannot be that a player who plays in third and fourth division in Europe is better than the player who plays in our top leagues on the continent. But we have to drive the question and, and exploit the new media platforms to build the profile of our players, uh, as you say. Uh, it's not only the administrator's history that's not known, the players' histories are not known. President, uh, uh, thanks for that. Uh, recent came out with, uh, after a long time, uh, with very innovative uh, proposals and decisions around uh, future com uh, competitions post-COVID. Uh, to write on what you've been mentioning, how do we raise the standard of the CAF Champions League, the CAF Confed Cup, uh, the AFCON, to bring it on par to what we look at uh, at UEFA, Conmi Ball, so that we attract these kind of sponsors, uh, TV broadcasting, and, and bring more revenue into and income into African football so that we can develop the game. It seems like there's been a lot of unity and good thinking at the last uh, CAF Expo meeting two days ago. Maybe as a CAF Vice President, you can give us some insights into the thinking at, at CAF at the moment. Yeah. You see, I, I think on the African continent, uh, the question of winning has come sometimes at the expense of the competition itself and at the expense of revenue generating possibilities. Because if you look at the Champions League matches, it doesn't matter whether that match is in Moscow, in Paris, uh, in Rome, or in Copenhagen, or anywhere in Europe. The quality of the production and the quality of the match remains constant and therefore the infrastructure technical and other infrastructure required to deliver the match remains the same on the african continent you find the match is supposed to play in a capital city is taken to a city outside the capital in order to win the match rather than to provide uh, enhancement and revenue opportunity for the competition and i think it's something that we have to look at. What are the technical minimum requirements for the club? And also what are the uh, media broadcast infrastructure required uh, for a Champions League match? And many of the journalists uh, in, in Africa can talk to you about how difficult uh, the host makes it for them to get the story out, to get good pictures, to get prime positions uh, and so on. So I think there must be uh, an overview and a refinement of 
what are the things that's required from each and every club to deliver in order to create uh, a competition that will attract uh, commercial partners? What are the things that the clubs must do to promote themselves? So there are these things. And of course, on the, on the, on the football side is to look at, and I think CAF is already looking at, looking at the quality of the stadium, looking at uh, accommodation, transportation, all of the logistical issues. Uh, and that must be put in a competition's manual to say, this is the manual for uh, the Champions League for CAF. Uh, we have to make sure that there's full compliance, failing which you are not going to be allowed to enter the competition. And I think if you look at uh, even the UEFA uh, uh, leagues, that uh, there is a consistent quality and standard, which is not the case. It depends on which country you play. Uh, and even in countries with best resources, will not play in the best stadiums, but will play in a stadium that they think will give them three points rather than give CAF uh, 10 million re in revenue. So it's that kind of thing that we must uh, improve the competition, to improve the revenue, to improve ultimately uh, the share of, of prize money that can go to the clubs. But if the clubs don't help us, we won't get there. So I think uh, we have to review uh, all of those compliance uh, for entry into our competitions. Thanks, uh, Pres. Coming back to 2010, uh, what was the legacy left behind by FIFA? Obviously, you mentioned a lot of uh, revenue that came in from there. Uh, some of our international guests might not be aware of, of some of the legacies that were left behind, how, how, how the country benefited, how some of the surrounding countries benefited from things like uh, the buses that were used uh, by the teams. Uh, if you could just give us briefly an idea of, 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 of what were some of the legacies, the tangible legacies that were left behind after the 2010 World Cup. <coughs> yeah. No, I also want to leave a question with you, the, the coaches there. You see, <laughs> as I've indicated, we had hoped that 2010 World Cup, Africa's first World Cup, will be a takeoff phase for African football. In other words, we've reached the quarterfinals. We'll now go to semi-final and hopefully uh, we'll reach the final. Now, what actually happened? 2010, we had a quarter-final as Ghana. 2014 in Brazil, no quarter-finalists, two teams in the second round. Uh, 2018 in Russia, all five teams drop out in the first round. So when you look superficially, you will see that was African football in the reverse. What happened? Why did it happen? And then you look at uh, a team like Croatia, who was not there, and many of the teams were not there in 2010, but then uh, made tremendous progress up to 2018. Uh, so that question, I have my own thought, but I won't answer it because I think it's for the technical people to say what happened from 2010 to 2018, and what are the projections for 2022? When it comes to the legacy of the World Cup one, uh, there was an infrastructure legacy clearly. We have 10 stadiums, world-class stadiums, uh, which has helped our league to now generate 1 billion rand, uh, South African rands in revenue because the infrastructure is there from broadcasting, security, telecommunication, all of the infrastructure was there. Secondly, uh, that we had training venues and these training venues became match venues for the national first division and our third division uh, of football in our country. Uh, secondly, there is the infrastructure of airports. The airport infrastructure meant that more aircraft landing could happen and they say a tremendous increase in tourists into our country from South America, uh, where previously our tourist inflows was essentially from Europe, uh, came now from South America and Asia 
a huge explosion of tourists from those areas, the result of the World Cup, and of course, from Americas. Uh, thirdly, was the, the question of something that we don't appreciate, but in 2008, we had a massive economic crisis. Uh, the meltdown and the collapse of major banks. South Africa hardly noticed it. Why? Because of the tremendous investment uh, in building infrastructure. Uh, we even have a street train in South Africa, uh, airports, 25 new hotels were built. And so there was increase in employment rather than uh, what happened throughout the world of people losing jobs here. People uh, got more and more jobs as a result of the infrastructure build program. Uh, fourthly was the question of uh, what you talked about, uh, Afro-pessimism. And, yeah. and I have been, I must have traveled more than 120 countries over the 10 years in two birds. And I can tell you the first question in every single country and whether it's Tokyo, whether it's Paris, whether it's Asuncion, whether it's Rio, whether it's Lima, Peru, the first question is, how dare you invite people to your country? Uh, and I don't want to repeat the negatives of all of those things. In, in 2000, and I think in 2002, 2003, The Economist had a headline on the front page of the magazine, Africa, the hopeless continent. So there was a perception that Africa is not a country of opportunity, is a, com a, con a continent for charity, for handouts and so on. After 2010, Africa came, became a major destination for trade, for investment, for tourism, and even the World Economic Summit was held in Ethiopia and in, 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 in Cape Town in South Africa. So people see Africa now as a major investment destination. And so that was exploded. And even a person like Kofi Annan, like Barack Obama, acknowledged that. And Thabo Mbeki said so, that this is the end of Afro-pessimism. We now see Africa as a hopeful continent, as previously seen as a hopeless continent. So I think exploding that myth, taking the knee of our neck, was a major achievement uh, of, of the 2010 World Cup. And I think that what we have to do now is to say, Africa cannot wait another 100 years to host the World Cup. What is it that we must do? Uh, because now the World Cup is a 48 nation World Cup. Uh, the game has changed. Uh, you see that three of the biggest uh, countries in the world, Mexico, United States, and Canada, has decided on a joint bid uh, for a 48 nations uh, World Cup. So the bar has been raised and we as African, on the African continent must develop a response to that challenge and say, this is our proposal as to how I, uh, we should make sure that in the shortest possible time, we, we get uh, a second World Cup on our continent and of course, there is a Women's World Cup. It's also been uh, growing uh, and now going to 32 nations uh, in the Women's World Cup. It's an opportunity for Africa. But I don't, I have my own thoughts on those things, but I think I must discuss it uh, within the, the structures uh, exactly how I think we should go about, but simply say that we cannot wait another 100 years for the World Cup. President, thanks. I think you, your, your, your parting words there were touching on women's sport. Uh, out of the most recent CAF Exco meeting, they came with a new innovation of introducing a, a women's Champions League uh, tournament on the African continent. Uh, what's your thoughts on this and, and what are the plans on the pipeline for further development of women's football in South Africa and on the continent? I think as uh, an African continent, uh, as I've indicated, that only eight countries out of 211 won the Men's World Cup over a period of almost uh, more than 80 years. Uh, 
our chances are much better to win the Women's World Cup even before we win the Men's World Cup. That to me is, 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 is possible within two World Cups. So if I look at our own country, we have done a lot to strengthen women in our, our structures. When we started in 2013, we had uh, about 50 women uh, in the structures, governance structures of football. Today, we have 395 women, some of them presidents of regions. Uh, we have taken a decision that every single one of our national women's team will be coached by a woman and by a South African woman. And we see the success of that. And uh, I don't have to tell you the, the misgivings we had when we started. We have now over 450,000 women footballers. We have started a national league for women's football. We just concluded with Mama Lodi Sundowns uh, being the champions. And they will be the first club to have both a men and women team playing in the CAF Champions League. Uh, so it's a huge achievement. When we come to the Women's Champions League, uh, and I think that it's something that we have to look at the detail. My own view is that we must not take uh, the approach of gradualism that in five years we'll have a Women's League. The world will leave us behind. We have to take uh, the step to say, this is the league uh, and this is a compliance for your team to play. And I know that if you look at the national teams on the African continent, the numbers of countries have now entered a women's competition where at first you, you have 16 or three or four. You now have the majority of African federations entering uh, the women's competition. Uh, and also the quality is, is improving. Uh, many of the women players from the continent now is playing all over in the best leagues in the world. And again, we have to strengthen our own league so that we don't have the same situation where our national teams will have to select 100% of our women players from clubs in Europe. And if we take too long, we will get there as well. So it is an urgent matter. Uh, I think uh, it was a very, very progressive decision to start a women's uh, champions league and now we must put in the details uh, and make sure there's uh, a compliance and the best teams on the continent get into the league uh, the league is broadcast so that we can see uh, the quality of of women's football on the continent uh, so i think that uh, was a decision that i certainly supported and now the next step of course is the Club World Cup for women. And we must uh, raise that issue that uh, FIFA must not wait too long to have a Club World Cup for women. And I think uh, then the, the position is complete. Uh, we cannot, the first men's World Cup was in 1930. The first women's World Cup was in 1991. 61 years later, the Club World Cup has been running. We cannot wait 61 years for a, a FIFA Women's Club World Cup. Uh, so that the structures uh, of women's football mirrors that of men's football. And I tell you the revenue opportunity in women's football is far greater than in men's football. I have to agree on you with some of those points, uh, President, especially when you talk about, I think African countries uh, if they plan and prepare properly, I think they have a greater chance in the, in the near future, in the short term, to win uh, the Women's World Cup than the Men's World Cup. Uh, but I think you posed the question to us here as we are technicians. A lot of us have been involved in studies uh, and research on, on, on long-term planning. And I think that's one of the the negative uh, aspects of African football where we go for short-termism and win at all costs. Uh, you look at countries, you mentioned there's only eight countries that won the World Cup. So it's, there's no secrets, it's not rocket science. Some of the case studies and research that we did was on, uh, on, on everyone knows, the much publicized uh, journey of uh, Brazil over 14 years, eventually 
starting in uh, 2000 and eventually winning the World Cup in Brazil. So it's a well-documented case. Uh, but we also went beyond that. We looked at some of the smaller countries. You mentioned Croatia, but we did a case study on, a, on Iceland. Iceland is such a tiny country, but they, they, they achieved. So uh, I think maybe with your influence at, uh, at that CAF level, we, we could possibly try to look at longer term planning uh, because it's, it's uh, history and science and research has shown us it's impossible to win the country without planning for over 10 to 12 years. Uh, four years is too little. Uh, you mentioned women's football. When I was working in Asia, I did uh, research into Japanese football. Japan has two long-term plans, a 50-year plan and a 100-year plan. Uh, one of their plans was to, ho to host the World Cup. They hosted the World Cup, but they also won the Women's World Cup. So long-term planning is, is the only way out. And we hope that uh, with your influence and leadership at CAF level, we could start uh, uh, looking how we, we, we design programs and how countries as the more talented uh, at all costs. Uh, I, I just wanted to, to, to bring in uh, one of our guests from the UK. He wanted to ask you a question. His name no, is... Uh, let me just... Oh, let me just before make, bring him. Let me yeah. just make uh, one remark on the issue that you raise. If you look at Germany, in the 2004 Euro finals in Portugal, <coughs> Germany dropped out in the first round of that Euro finals. They had Lothar Mateos and so-called experienced players in that team. Yeah. They started after the Euro finals in 2004 and yeah. won the World Cup in 2014. That's a 10-year period. And if you look at what happened, the, 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 the approach of German football in that 2004 Euro finals and the German football produced in 2014 when they won the World Cup. Now you have skillful players, uh, like Completely Ozil. Different. Yes. Those players would not have been fitting into a German team in 2004. So that's why I say there was a complete rethink of what constitutes a German team and what is required to win the World Cup. And I think uh, those are the kind of issues that we must leave to you. There are many examples. France is another yeah. example. Yeah. Uh, and, and so Spain, yeah. 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 No, I, I, I think that's a good observation, uh, President, because I think Germany looked at uh, modern trends in the game and even future trends, how the game is going to change. And I think one of the things they also did was embrace the diversity because they have uh, immigrants, people of different heritage, North African heritage, West African heritage, uh, Eastern European heritage. So they embrace that diversity and, 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 and they did designed a program around that and by having a specific playing philosophy a specific philosophy they, they won the world cup uh so 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 i think that's very important it's it's sad that this time and age there's no Afri african country that has designed its own uh playing methodology its own playing philosophy training methodology i think south africa is one of the first to 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 st start working in that uh, uh direction you mentioned before that Africa was always seen as, as a dumping ground, as, as wanting hands out. And I think one of our, of, of our colleagues here today, Howard Gale, the, the, the former Liverpool player, is, is, is very uh, also uh, radical on this, is that we, we had an influx of, of, of uh, European coaches and not all of them bring add value, you know. So I think that is something that at CAF level, we need to look at the quality of our coach education. How do we empower our coaches? Because everyone is obsessed about getting a UEFA coaching license. So how do we bring the CAF licenses up onto that level? Likewise, you mentioned the clubs. The clubs are not uh, really marketed. And I feel the good in innovation licensing system will help uh, African football developed to, to, to really global standards whereby it improves everything around the, the football, the coaching, the administration, the refereeing, everything will, 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 will raise to that level. 
Uh, but I would like to bring in a guest from the UK. He's, he's a famous author and a sports journalist. He's done a lot of research on African football. He wanted to ask you a very interesting question. His name is uh, Satish Sekha. Satish, over oh. to you. Good afternoon, no. President. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. I hope you are too. It's, it's good that we meet on Zoom now. We can't <laughs> meet face to face. Indeed. Uh, my question is, should the legacy of Africa's World Cup include recognition of footballers who contributed to the freedom of their country, especially like South Africa? Yes, I, I think um, it is something that uh, has to be done because, you know, that is the, the, the other uh, omission of African football. Uh, we can rattle off uh, the history of Maradona, of Xavi, of Iniesta, uh, of Michael Owen, and so on, Beckham, and so on. Uh, but the history of African players is largely known in, only in their own country. And of course, uh, when you come to the liberation struggle <coughs> and apartheid, uh, there was no communication between African countries. Uh, and, and so, uh, and there were no television either. And uh, what we have then is that the, the huge contribution that these players have made and the sacrifices that Africa has made uh, in the fight uh, against apartheid, uh, the boycott of the Olympics, uh, the Montreal Olympics, uh, and other major events that uh, African countries decided not to participate in the push for the Grand Eagles Agreement uh, and, and uh, the, within the Commonwealth, the African countries, as they became more and more uh, uh, members of these international uh, bodies, helped to strengthen. And certainly on the field of play, many players made the sacrifices. And of course, uh, many of players walking uh, on the streets of the African continent uh, would have been great if uh, they had the opportunity to participate. And many of them uh, would try to be co-opted into white football and white football competitions and had refused. So yes, uh, I agree with you. Uh, I have received your proposal. Uh, we already started our discussion, must continue it and complete this project. It's an important project because no one but ourselves must write our history. Absolutely. Thank you, Satish. Uh, thank you, President. Uh, okay. Howard Gale, we have a uh, former Liverpool legend, Howard Gale, the first black player to play for Liverpool. He's very, very interested in the development and I think it's on some very uh, our coaches. Uh, Howard, over to you, my brother. Thank you, brother, and uh, good evening or good afternoon to all. Um, I've followed African football for, for many years, and again, as I say, although I've been born in, in Liverpool in the UK. I see myself as, a, as an African before um, an Englishman and I don't say that with, uh, with jest. Um, I remember my father used to say to us, my father came from Sierra Leone in West Africa to Liverpool just after the war and he always used to say to me that Africans used to think that the, the streets of Europe were paved with gold and it wasn't until the African seamen started to, to get here and to settle here that the they seen that that wasn't the case. But um, again, in, in relation to, to African and to African football, and also to, to us as black people, is that we've got a mentality, a culture about us, that we think that white people are better than us and can achieve more than us and can do more than us. And I've watched this with them. Um, with, with, with African football throughout the, the, the World Cup over the last 20 years. And I think it, there, there comes a time now where it is, we have to start relying on each other, not just in Africa, but around the world. 
where is again we could we are the product. If you look at Liverpool's football team right now, it took us 30 years to achieve um, another Premier League, and it's no mistake that 90% of the team are black. That's why the 20 yeah. odd points again, as I say, ahead of um, of of the rest of the teams. Now, again, as I say, there's this mentality again from from Europe and also go from Africans that if we come to Europe. Again, we live in Europe. Again, I know that there's some players again who um, who try to get out of doing or playing international football because they've got to travel back and they're comfortable in the surroundings. And it's it's trying to change that mentality. Pele said years ago that when an African team or African country wins the sorry, the World Cup, you'll never get it back. And he and he, and he's right. But I think that the way forward for us. Is to is to coach educate our people. Again, I've got again, uh, I've got a high profile here in the UK, but I can't mm. get a, a job as a coach because I'm black, and that's the simple answer for it. And it's the same again with with John Barnes and with other players again uh, from this from our area who've been more successful than me at international level and at club level. But they can't get a job within football. So what I've spoke, what I've suggested to to a, a few of my friends is, why don't we go back to Africa and coach educate our own people, so that in the future, as I say, that our people will have the skill base. Because again, the, if if you, if you look at the, the the complicity of this, is that what clubs will do? They'll take players. They'll take players from the continent of Africa. I've never seen them take a coach or a manager. So that's the level that we're, we're at. That's the level that we're at here again. In Europe, there aren't many coaches, there aren't many black coaches, and there aren't many black managers. And you need somebody with inside the club to give you a, a heads up or a hand up the ladder because you won't get there on your own velocity or your own, your own skill base. Is that because they see the colour of your skin first? So what I've been saying to a lot of my colleagues who've been who've been top players in Europe, not just in in, in England, is why don't we go back to Africa and coach educate our, our, our own coaches so that when our kids get to to, to the ages again of, of three, four, five, now they're getting introduced into quality coaching and have a better mindset about the game, how the game's played, how it's how it develops and what you need to do as a player to fit into this world. Yes. Uh, hello. Hello. Yes, President Kerry. Oh, no, I, I totally agree. And uh, congratulations to Liverpool. Thank you. And now that you have a non-racial team, you must yeah. just see who scored all your goals. Yeah. Um, and You've been our best I, player. And yes, and that debunks the myth. Uh, I saw your team in, in Doha in the finals of the World Club, uh, World Cup. Uh, not just do they play as a team, they are united, uh, yeah. the spirit amongst them. And you can yeah. see they are football players, they are Liverpool supporters, they are uh, committed, they support one another. They don't yeah. look at the question, what is a color? They look at the capability and the capacity. And I think that's the issue that you raise, that uh, capacity knows no color. Yeah. The strange thing is about uh, world sport is that there was a long time when the all black rugby team was all white. Yeah. The day they decided to put black players, they become world champions over and yeah. over. Uh, the, South African rugby team only started winning the World Cup once they dispensed with the idea that rugby should be an all-white team. But when the black players came, and the last example now is uh, the World Cup in Japan, the major impact players and the captain were all black players. And there was a long argument of hundreds of years that we cannot put in black players in the white rugby team because they are not, uh, you know, there is a, a, a phrase that coaches even like to use. No, they must still grow up. They are not matured enough. They are, 
and that is only a reference to black players. Yeah. Uh, and and they must mature. They are immature. Yeah. They how the hell you tell a 25, 26 year old man mm -hmm. uh, is immature? But, so I think uh, we we have to tackle yeah. this issue. I agree with you, and maybe that connection between the players who play in 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 Europe. Uh, and why is it that Didier Drogba, Samuel Eto, Abedi Pele, George Weir, and all of these players becomes great Top only players. once yes. they have a, a white coach? Yes. Uh, and, and so uh, there are so many issues, but certainly the yeah. issue that you raise is important and uh, we will continue uh, mm. to engage on, on this question. Yeah, if I could yeah. just add to this, I think, I think that one of the worst things that can happen for African football is for one of the nations to achieve success or to achieve it with a white coach because they will never let, a, let us forget it, that look what we did for you. And we've always, again, as I say, I know that it'd be the same way we are all around the world, is that we've always got to prove ourselves. We've always got to be better than them. We've always got to jump over these hurdles. They put, the, they put barriers up in front of us and we've always got to go round them or climb over them to, to fit into their world. And again, I, I tell people on a daily basis that everybody on this planet originates out of Africa. Everybody. So again, you've got, yeah. if you look deep into your ancestry, you've got black um, relatives. African so again, uh, how, how, how you come with us and how you treat us, you need to look at your history and the same history that's told you a lie is the same history that's yeah. lied about us. Howie, yes. I think uh, that's a great way to close, uh, President. I think we've got one minute left. Uh, okay. Howard Gale, we would, we would leave you to, to, to lobby and to gather all our uh, brothers in Europe and we form a movement and bring everyone back home yes. to Africa. Yes. Uh, President, yeah. on behalf yeah. of everyone on this platform, thank you a lot for availing yourself uh, and for, for interacting and, and for giving us uh, some of your time. I think everyone appreciates uh, the input, although, although most of us are coaches, but I think we got a lot of insight into, in, into the other parts of the game that we probably don't know about. So once again, thank you a lot, President, for, for, for availing yourself. And thanks to all the colleagues here who joined in. Thanks a lot. Okay, my pleasure. Thank you very much. Thanks to everyone. Thanks to everyone.